That man, Dana Altman, has done it again. Organs to the round of 32, full reaction. Here we go. You are Locked On Ducks, your daily podcast on the Oregon Ducks, part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. Yes, it is that time once again for Locked On Ducks. I'm your host, Spencer McLaughlin. Thank you so much for making this your first listen or your first view of the day post-Oregon beating the one and only South Carolina Gamecocks in the round of 64. If you have not already, please like, comment, subscribe, rate, and review wherever you listen to or watch this show because this is a part of the Locked On Network, your team every day, and your number one source to stay up to date with the Ducks. This episode is brought to you by our friends at Nissan. Are you the kind of driver that likes to push things a little further? Ever wonder what adventure could be around the next corner? Take the Nissan Rogue, Nissan Pathfinder, or Nissan Armada and go find your next big adventure. Check them all out today at NissanUSA.com. Remember like two weeks ago when Oregon was going to go to the NIT and there were plenty of Oregon fans online who wanted Dana Altman to be removed as Oregon's head coach? I don't think that those people are going to be vocal anymore. Not saying there wasn't an argument to be made, but that argument has been thrown out the window from the 24th floor where I'm coming to you from at my hotel in Las Vegas where I watched that beautiful spectacle unfold against the Gamecocks. And and that notion of Dana Altman not being Oregon's coach, it has gone crashing down and it is shattered because Oregon, with Jermaine Cousinard and Folly Dante leading the way, who I'll get to in more detail later in the show, just a, a masterful coaching clinic by Dana Altman. The start was kind of back and forth, both teams feeling each other out. It was a low-scoring game at the half, and then Oregon just turns it on in the second half, and Kuznar just, just never missed. I don't know if he actually missed a shot. Dante missed a shot. Guy's a bum, right? Anyway, so I, I think that this was just an awesome game to watch. Like The, the turnaround around this team and around this program over the last couple of weeks has been just nothing short of remarkable. And this game was just the epitome of that because it was so well played at both ends of the floor. Oregon did so many things well. South Carolina played some good defense and hit some shots, but Oregon was just better. Time and time again, Oregon was just better. Now, I have got a very special guest for all of you to make a brief appearance here on the show because, as some of you may know, I was not watching this game by myself in Las Vegas. This behind me is my older brother, Mitchell. We are here in Las Vegas all week as a Christmas gift from our parents were the New York, New York, and... <sighs> Mitchell, that was just a good time, man. Just, just a good time. Hop in. What'd you think? It's a great day to be a Duck fan, Spencer. I can tell you that right now. What a complete game. I mean, I outside of a couple of slow moments for the Ducks, everything was so smooth and flowed together so well. I think keeping people out of foul trouble, too, also something you don't often see with the Ducks. It's one of those things, even when, you know, Kuznard is having a great game. Usually that's a game in the past where Dante is maybe also in foul trouble. We didn't see that today. Dante not picking up his first foul until the second half. And then that allowed him to really dominate a lot of the game, especially on the defensive end. I think you and I were talking the whole game. The whole game. The whole game. Dante's defense is out of this world. I... I, it's and some of them, some of the plays who are not going to show up in in the stat book, but the impact he has on the game. We were watching the South Carolina guards drive into the paint, and then just like the Simpsons meme with the grandpa, where he just <laughs> U turns and comes right back out because they see Dante coming over to him. Just perfectly coached. Again, a testament to Dana Altman, as yeah. you saw of the history of Oregon big men who know how to defend the paint and put it into practice when the season matters. I, and then, you know, it helps when you have Kuznar dropping 40. Yeah, the 40 first time piece. anyone does, has done that since. Uh, do you know this guy, Steph Curry? He's pretty good. I might have heard of him. His career's know. gone pretty well. Kuznard with just the legendary offensive performance. It runs in the family, folks, by the way, in case you did not actually, my dad can never do that, but he absolutely can. That's why Mitchell, thanks so much for stopping by, man. Appreciate it. So, Appreciate you having me. Um, I, I, I just loved watching this game. <laughs> I absolutely loved watching this game. How great was he, huh? Because it, it just had such a different feel, right? I was ready to air takes to defend Dana Altman and say, yep, if you missed the tournament a third year in a row, here's why I think that's okay. And, and instead, you're now looking at a matchup with Creighton, which I'll also talk about later in the show, to go to the Sweet 16. 
that's just phenomenal stuff. Now, I did think Oregon would win the game, and you heard me talk with Andrew Lyon of Locked On South Carolina on uh, the last episode that, that I did of the show about the importance of staying out of foul trouble. And Oregon, I mean, just barely held on. I thought K.J. Evans on at least one, maybe two of his fouls got jarred pretty hard by the officials. And look, they were not good. There were calls that went Oregon's way in this game. No, no, no question about it. There were calls that went Oregon's way in this game. There were a lot of calls that didn't go Oregon's way. But what I tweeted out was that if you're good enough, you got to be able to overcome. I didn't say the first part of it, but that's just the reality. If you are a good enough team, you can overcome that sort of stuff. And Oregon, we talked about the importance of foul trouble on the last episode. It was an issue for the Ducks, but they were able to find their way through it. So just just such a great performance. You know, it's not one that I would describe as, you know, oh, they scrapped, they clawed, they fought, they scrapped, they just, you know, found a way to win. No, this was just a good game. This was just a good game plan. I think the offense early in the game was a little bit sluggish, but then they got into their sets. They were getting movement. They were getting Dante good touches. They were finding open shooters. Kuznard was just oh, so unbelievably good. This is just this is just the epitome. This is the epitome of, of, of Dana Altman in March coming through when it matters most. When the season is on the line, he just came through and delivered. And yeah, he's got players that are out there, you know, having just the games of their lives sometimes. I mean, the last two games, career highs for Enfali Dante, career highs for Jermaine Kuznard, boom, wins for the Ducks. And he's talked a lot about leadership and the leadership that those two guys have provided for this team, for this program, and how, you know, this, this basketball team for Oregon goes through those two. Well, what do you know? They have career games and back-to-back -back performances and they're the two biggest wins of the year for the Ducks. Pac-12 tournament and now the first round of the NCAA tournament. Dana Altman continues his record unblemished in the first round of every postseason tournament with the Ducks, including the NCAA tournament. He's never lost a first round game in the NCAA tournament, the CBI, or the NIT. I didn't order those correctly. It's NIT, then CBI, which Dana won in his first year as Oregon's head coach. I, I just think this guy is still so locked in and doing such a great job, and his passion, his energy is all there. Just a, a phenomenal, phenomenal coaching performance with some outstanding individual performances. But, uh, you know, I, I picked Oregon to win this game in, in, in my bracket. And by the way, love all of you that submitted entries to the Locked On Ducks bracket. Uh, you know, it's just for fun, but you know what? It's a great time, and I appreciate the community, and I appreciate all of you, and th this has just been... Uh, a great week for Oregon basketball for, for so many reasons. And I'm going to save even more big picture takes that have been going around in my head until the season comes to a close because I don't know when that's going to be. I don't know when that's going to be because, man, is Kuznard going to go for 40 against Creighton? No, I don't expect that to take place. But could you see Shellstad have a bigger scoring role? Could you see Dante have uh, you know a game like he did against Colorado? I mean, he was great in this game. He's hitting free throws. Oregon was hitting some threes. Uh, K.J. Evans defensively was so, so great. I, I mean, you, you heard my brother earlier talking about the defensive execution that they had. I, I thought it was fantastic. I, I, thought it was, I thought it was good. The final score didn't necessarily reflect it, but I thought Oregon's defense, 28 points allowed in the first half, and it, it shouldn't even have been that. Because they banked in a three at the end of the half, and you're like, oh my goodness, are you kidding me? Instead of an eight-point lead, it's a five-point lead, and Oregon just put their foot on their necks in the second half. It was magnificent. Nothing was as magnificent in that game as Jermaine Kuznard, though. He and Enfali Dante both were terrific, and I'll break down their individual performances there. After, we talk about a new sponsor here at the network. This episode is brought to you by the spring cleaning champions, Manscaped. This season, make sure to groom your carpets and the drapes with the leaders in below-the-waist grooming. Clear out that winter bush with Manscaped, with Manscaped's Lawnmower 5.0, and watch your confidence bloom like the springtime flowers and this Oregon basketball team. Embrace the season and join the 10 million men worldwide who trust Manscaped with our special offer. Go to manscaped.com, use code Locked On for 20% off plus free shipping. This stuff is going to do what you need it to. I don't need to explain the purpose of this particular product. What I am explaining is that it is going to work for you. It also, all their products feature LED, dual LED spotlights to guide you through the darkest winter debris, navigate with confidence in your delicate areas, 
I love this thing because it comes with a compact case. You can take it with you everywhere you go and it gives you a bevy of supplies to get everything that you need. Get 20% off and free shipping with code locked on at manscaped.com. That's 20% off and free shipping with the code locked on at manscaped.com. Nothing like a little spring cleaning in your pants. This episode also brought to you by our friends over at Game Time. You shouldn't have to worry when buying tickets to your next big event. Maybe you're going to go to the Oregon game in Pittsburgh in the round of 32 against Creighton. Could be fun. Game Time is the fast and easy way to buy tickets for all the sports, music, comedy, and theater events near you. With killer last-minute deals, all-in prices, views from your seat, and their best price guarantee, Game Time takes the guesswork out of buying tickets. Game Time's the only ticketing app that gives you complete peace of mind with your purchase. They're obsessed with finding ways to help you save money on your tickets, too. They have deals on tickets right up to the start of the event, even an hour after it starts. It's the place to find last-minute seats. Take the guesswork out of buying tickets with Game Time. Download the Game Time app, create an account, use code Locked On for $20 off your first purchase. Terms apply. Again, create an account, redeem code L-O-C-K-E-D-O-N for $20 off. Download Game Time today. Last minute tickets, lowest price guaranteed. Jermaine Kuznard with an NCAA Oregon tournament record. A 40-piece a 40 piece. I gotta double check how many he finished with because holy smokes, that guy had everything. And I mean everything in the bag because he was playing against his former team. 73 points, also a pretty solid defensive effort. Kuznard with 40, Dante with 23, Shellstad with 11. I'll get to Dante, but Jermaine Kuznard, man. First of all, if you didn't know, James Crepe of the Oregonian tweeted this out. Kuznard's grandma, who lives in Chicago, is not able to fly, and she has never seen Jermaine Kuznard play as an Oregon Duck. Rather, she hadn't until she and Jermaine's dad drove to Pittsburgh for this game. His whole family was there. His grandma had never seen him play in person. And he goes for a career-high Oregon NCAA tournament record 40 points in a win to put the Ducks in the round of 32 and extend the season? Does it get better than that? I, I don't know that it does. I don't know that it does. But Kuznard, his ability to master the float game and finish at the rim is unparalleled when he is in the zone like this. His strength is probably his greatest attribute. And, you know, Oregon in this game from beyond the arc was 7 of 16. That's solid. That's solid. And I've said all week, and when people have asked me or talked to me about the game, I said, you know, Oregon just needs to be able to hit some threes. You know, the two threes they made against Colorado in the Pac-12 title game, that's not going to be sustainable in the NCAA tournament. And that would have been the case. If Oregon only made two threes, they would have had 15 fewer points and won the game by 14. And, you know, it just it would have been tight at that point. And, and I, you can only squeak out so many of those. But this is just such a great performance and a great win. And Kuznard's ability, he was dialed from the start. I love his shot selection. And, and the way that he just carves his way into the painted area and, and then finds a shot that goes in with a pretty high percentage clip. I mean, his efficiency in this game, 14 of 22 for 40 points, 7 of 7 at the line. Nails, absolute nails from Jermaine Kuznard here. Game of his life when Oregon needed it the most. And Dante needed the game of his life against Colorado, and Oregon needed Kuznard here, and I mean, gosh almighty, he was just awesome, and he was hitting his threes. I mean, when Kuznard is hitting his threes, this is a true three-level score. You know, his mid-range game is just all right, but his float game, right, you almost think of it in four levels. Layups, and tough contested finishes, the floater, the mid-range, the three-point shot. Kuznar was 5 of 9 from beyond the arc. And I tell you what, I don't know that any of his threes even hit the rim. He put up a couple. There was one sequence where Dante had a block and then Kuznard came down kind of one on four when they were sagging off and he just pulled in transition, hit it, and it gave Oregon like a 14 or a 17-point lead kind of with seven or eight minutes gone in the second half. Once I saw that shot go in, I thought, oh, Oh, if that if, if that's going in, we got something. We're cooking here. We're we're working. We we got things that we're 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 we're, we're, we're liking with this team at both ends of the floor. Oregon held South Carolina in this game, forty five percent shooting, not great. Eleven to twenty four from beyond the arc, also not great. Eleven turnovers, not a huge number. And yet you look up, South Carolina attempted nineteen free throws and only had seventy three points. 
If you hit 11 threes in a game and shoot 45% from the floor, you should be able to score more than 73 points, but they didn't. They missed a few free throws. So too did Oregon. Dante was 9 of 15. I'll get to him in a moment, but... And Dante was great. I'm not about to say, you know, should have been better or something like that. Like, no, Dante was amazing. But I, I thought Oregon's defense, once again, though South Carolina is the first in uh, Oregon's now five consecutive victories to go over the 70-point threshold, I thought their defense was outstanding. I think South Carolina just hit a couple shots. They got a little lost sometimes. They need to tighten down those screws against Creighton, who have got some knockdown shooters. But... I, I loved the way Oregon played this game defensively from the start. I thought the activity, the energy, Shellstad had a steal and a breakaway. KJ Evans, in, oh man, Evans' potential is through the roof. Through the roof. My brother and I were just uh, we were just gawking over that the whole game. You know, he he's watches a, a decent amount of Oregon basketball, but mostly, you know, in the month of March and whatnot. And he, of course, never misses a football game. But, you know, he, he was watching Evans going, man. That guy's there. Man, that guy's there defensively again. And he was great. I I thought Evans had the most underrated performance of this game. Eight points, six rebounds, two blocks, and a steal in 29 minutes. When that's your fourth score, that's a great outing. That's a great outing. And and I thought that he played well. Here's the other thing with Kuznard, to put a bow on his performance. When a guy has 40 points, how often does he have six assists? That's some James Harden stuff. This is a college game. You got 40 minutes, not 48. You have 40 points and six assists. The way that Kuznard just just dominated the game and was facilitating. He had some great lob passes, and we can't talk about lob passes without discussing that beauty from Jadrian Tracy to Anfali Dante early in the second half. You talk about a tone-setting play. That's a stupidly hard pass. Tracy's on the left wing, and Kuznard gets screened down. He reverse screens on Dante's guy to set up for the lob. Tracy's holding the ball over his head, chucks it right into Dante's hands, who powers it through in the air for the alley-oop. That was majestic. Just incredible. And the way that Oregon shared the ball in this game, 16 assists on 28 made field goals, you take 16 assists any day of the week. If you have 16 assists as an offense, you're going to be in really good shape. You're also going to be in a good spot when you've got Enfali Dante. I bet some of you thought I was about to go to a live read. No, no, no. Not yet. Dante in this game, 23 points quietly because he was just 7-9 and nine from the floor. Only had six rebounds. Had two blocks. But his presence at the defensive end, he was 9-15 of 15 from, the, from the free throw line. That's okay. Would love for that to be 11 or 12 of 15. Dante's not going to hit all of them, but he hit enough of them and... It, like the offensive game was still there. His impact on the offensive rebounding was was fantastic. But I mean, let me tell you something. N. Folly Dante was was so much more impactful in this game than six rebounds, two steals, and two blocks at the defensive end. Which, by the way, is a great box score for any big guy. Six rebounds, two steals, two blocks. That's great. He was even more impactful than that. Because every time, as you heard my brother Mitchell mention earlier, every time South Carolina, whether it was a big or a guard, drove into the lane, that either missed because Dante was altering the shot, because Dante was in their heads, or they just ran away. They just drove in and said, nope, we're not doing that. I got told a story one time by someone who was a walk-on on a Washington team many years ago up in Seattle at a Mariners game about Kenny Wooten. And the last time Oregon went to the Sweet 16 in the same spot, had to win the Pac-12 tournament, that year Kenny Wooten in the game up in Seattle had like six or seven blocks. He was just all over the place. And I was asking him about that game. And what he told me was, dude, I'm just telling you, that guy sucked the soul out of our team. They were terrified of him. After he blocked two shots in the first couple minutes, we were so scared to go in there. That's what South Carolina was. They were worried about Dante everywhere, all the time. He is a one-man wrecking crew. He is as impactful defensively And he's got a huge impact offensively as well. And they've done such a great job at that end of the floor over the last several weeks. But he is as impactful defensively as Draymond Green. I don't say that lightly. He is a one-man defense sometimes. He'll challenge a shot here. He'll box a guy out, go get the rebound all the time. And he makes it look easy. It's not. His ability to be athletic and move his feet and block shots is fantastic. He and K.J. Evans... 
combining for four blocks. Tracy had one as well. Rigsby had one. Six blocks for the Ducks. That's a great number. But those two guys down low, their length, their presence was in the heads of South Carolina that entire game. They made their presence felt early and often, and then they repeated it all throughout the game. And Oregon got the win. So what comes next for the Ducks? We'll talk about that. right after we talk about Nissan. This week's March Madness Bracket Highlight is brought to you by our friends at Nissan. Each week, we're picking one team that stands out, a team that's pushed it further than the rest, just like any of the all-new 2024 Nissan SUVs. These guys were able to take it to the next level. The Yukon Huskies are the Nissan Armada, top seed in the East Region. They're a powerhouse, top overall seed in the NCAA tournament. The Auburn Tigers are the Nissan Pathfinder. They've been thrilling to watch and have created a lane for themselves after claiming the top spot in the SEC, beating Florida in the SEC tournament. I've got Auburn going to the Final Four, and once again, your Oregon Ducks are the Nissan Rogue. The team absolutely surprised us all with a powerful performance in the final Pac-12 tournament, punching their ticket to the big dance. They say, win life, go Rogue. That's exactly what the Ducks have done here, and they did it again against South Carolina in the first round. On to the round of 32. We'll get to Creighton in just a moment. Take the Nissan Rogue, Nissan Pathfinder, or Nissan Armada, and go find your next big adventure. Shop at NissanUSA.com. So what's next for the Ducks? Round of 32 on Saturday against three-seed Creighton. Full disclosure, I have Creighton in my Final Four. I am in no way, shape, or form rooting for that to happen. I would love for Oregon to get to the Sweet 16. Because you know what? I've seen double-digit seeds get to the Elite Eight, get to the Final Four. The last team that made a run like this was Oregon State a couple of years ago. You know where they went? The Elite Eight. That'd be electric. <laughs> Playing a game with a chance to go to the Final Four? That'd be awesome. That'd be absolutely awesome. But the reason, I initially put Oregon straight through to the Sweet 16, but then the Midwest region is just so screwy, but wide open, that I said, ah, I think Creighton's the best overall team. And I do think that Creighton's the best overall team. That does not mean that Oregon can't beat them. They can't. Now, Dana Altman said in his post-game presser that, you know, the Ducks are going to have to play their best basketball that they have all year to win the game. He's 100% right. He is 100% right because Creighton is an excellent basketball team. They were in the Elite Eight last year, got some returners there. The matchup between Cockbrenner, their post player, I think is how you pronounce that, and, and Enfali Dante, the broadcast is going to talk about that more than a couple of times. That, that That's ultimately going to define who's able to have more success offensively because their big guys are so important. But Creighton has got shooters. They are very well coached. And this is an awesome matchup. Like, just, just step back for a moment. Dana Altman is still beloved at Creighton. I think a reporter tweeted out that, you know, in Pittsburgh, there were going to be some Creighton fans since it's all, you know, taking place in the same gym who are rooting for Dana Altman against South Carolina because they, they still like him that much over there. And Obviously, we like him a lot in Eugene. I think everyone who was out on him, you're welcome to come back to the table and say, okay, I was wrong. Dana Altman should be Oregon's coach uh, for the foreseeable future, and he almost certainly will be. And, you know, the last two times, I would mentioned this going into the tournament, that Oregon only got in because of the automatic qualifier with the conference tournament. They went to the Sweet 16. And both times, lost to the eventual national champion. Could I see that happening? Yeah, absolutely. But I picked Creighton to the Final Four for a reason. I, I watch a lot of college basketball. I've watched plenty of Creighton this year. They're really good. They're, they're, they're really, really good. They, they are a very well-coached team at both ends. You know, they had uh, not as tough of an opponent, but still, they played Akron out of the Mid-American Conference, and uh, they shellacked them. They, they looked impressive. They were really, really good. It's not easy to get blowout wins in March. Creighton did that. They, they were ahead by 20-plus in the second half, I think, and you know they, they just were really impressive start to finish. And they have guys that can score at all three levels. They have guys who can defend. Oregon's going to have to be at their best. They're, they're going to have to be at their absolute best if they're going to, to advance to the Sweet 16. But guess what? They're playing their best basketball right now. And Kuznar does need to go for 40, might need to go for 18 to 20 again. Shellstad might need to have more than 11 points. Maybe, you know, Bam Tracy gets involved or, you know, Cario Oquenda. Only two points off the bench for Oregon in this game. That happens when you have a starter in Jermaine Kuznar who goes for a 40-piece. But Oregon with 53 second-half points. That's a crazy number. Crazy, crazy number. But 
Yeah, I, I think Oregon will need a little bit more bench production. You know, one of four combined for two points between Rigsby, Diawara. Diawara is not expected to score, uh, but did some really nice things in the minutes that are asked of him. Uh, but Rigsby and Aquendo, you'd love to get a little bit more uh, out of those guys. Again, it doesn't need to be a 10 to 15 point performance, just, you know, six and six apiece. Just, just lighten the load a little bit. Don't be so reliant on you know having to have your starters in there to score at all times, right? When your starters need a rest or maybe they have to come out because of foul trouble, it'd be nice to be able to get a little, a little bit more right there. But uh, all in all, I, I think Oregon has to feel really confident. And how can you not? I, I think this has been such a phenomenal run so far, a great end of the season, and you know it's not over. It, it, it is not over. It's a great run at the end of the season and that's when you need to play your best and and, and Oregon is so you know is Creighton very good yep they, they are but guess what this is March I've seen a lot crazier things happen than in March than Oregon as an 11 seed beating Creighton as a three seed like it, it's it, it it gets very very real now where you say okay you win one you're in the sweet 16 you get to hang out all week talking about you know what what your game is going to be like or thinking about the matchup and anything, everything like that but for now Oregon fans get to enjoy this one as we all should certainly my brother and I will we're gonna have dinner at Din Tai Fung and then we're going to Penn and Teller later tonight so good times in Sin City appreciate everyone listening I'll see you next time have a wonderful rest of your day and as always go Ducks